So the main idea is, is basically, you know, how to document the extraordinary achievements what you have done in the cancer discovery. So uh, I think when Redanasar was telling me about you, I was I was kind of fascinated that you were the discoverer of oncogenes. So even though I did my PhD in the cancer field, I didn't really know. <laughs> yeah. So, sir, uh, I mean, we have your history in, in uh, listed in many places, but maybe you can give a brief, like how you started, where you are from, and, and where where you are right now, sir. Okay, so <laughs> I'm from Hyderabad. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, you know, I actually I did my high school in Tirupati, and uh, oh, okay, I, sir. I came for college education to Hyderabad. The real okay. reason to come here was when I graduated from high school. I was only thirteen years old, and okay. um, there was a age restriction for yeah. <laughs> all universities in India. You had to be minimum yeah. of 16 to enter into college. But yeah. only was one university and Delhi University, JNU, didn't have this restriction. So yeah. okay. I got admitted in, in both these universities when I applied okay. for it. And I chose Usman University because it was capital of Andhra Pradesh and my cousins yeah. were living here. And okay. my parents were unwilling to send me yeah, at that age to Delhi <laughs> to <Okay>. study <laughs> college. Okay. So okay. anyway, I did, uh, uh, I completed my college education here. I did my MS in chemistry, actually, from Usman okay. University. Okay. And then I joined, at that time, it was called Regional Research Lab. Now it is called IICT. So okay. Dr. Balgoa, had come there as the chair of the biochemistry department. And when I was in MSc, he organized an international symposium. It was a, actually a very major symposium. All Nobel laureates came for this symposium. Francis Craig was there, Jack Mano was there. Uh, you asked for it. Uh, the, the leaders in molecular biology were all there. And, uh, you know, and we had a biochemistry chair, Dr. Ramachandran, in Usman University. He, I mean, he knew I was very interested in, uh, uh, in molecular biology. I used to ask him a lot of questions about DNA structure and stuff like that. He one day came to me and said, you should go and attend this symposium. And... Okay. Uh, so I went and attended that symposium, and it was a very eye-opening event for me. He, it was, you know, truly, you know, outstanding in the sense uh, I could really understand what is the leading questions that were being asked in molecular biology. So in that symposium, I asked Dr. Bargwa that I am finishing my uh, MS and whether I can join as a graduate student. Then he mm -hmm. said, you finish your graduate student and if you get really good grades, <laughs> I will take you. So luckily for me, uh, I was the, I graduated in the top of my class in MS and okay. I went to him and uh, asked him, uh, or whether I can join his uh, lab for for research, and I said okay. he said yes, and he actually took about uh, uh, four four th three students from my class. There was another okay. person by name Vijay Kumar, another person mm -hmm. uh, Narayana. Uh, so mm -hmm. the three of us joined uh, his lab, and and, uh, and he asked me, "What do you want to work on?" I said, I okay. want to work DNA. <laughs> so, <laughs> so okay. uh, 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 then he says, I have a very good project on a, in protein biochemistry. You will finish your graduate studies very quickly. I said, no, I want to work on DNA. 
okay. then uh, he explained a research project which actually which connected me to the symposium which i uh, uh, which i attended when you know, i was in ms so he yeah. was telling me there is this dogma dna to rna to protein mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, the the evidence that uh, rna was important for protein synthesis came from the experiment of a german scientist called jean brache okay mm-hmm. he actually attended that symposium and presented his data what he mm-hmm. essentially did was he took onion root tip cells he was a botanist <laughs> so he is okay. a plant biologist and he he was he went into molecular biology and he mm-hmm. was able to culture onion root cells in in tissue culture and he treated them with ribonuclease okay okay unlike mm-hmm. mammalian cells plant mm-hmm. cells apparently especially onion root tip cells uptake proteins okay, okay. Mm-hmm. so the rna the rnas went and he could show all the rna was degraded and there was no protein synthesis okay and he okay. could show that this block to protein synthesis occurs in the very first 5 minutes or uh, the mm-hmm. onion root tip cells make tons of protein and uh, uh, you know and and mm-hmm. the entire protein synthesis machine really came to a dead stop with that so that was at that time the in the symposium francis craig got up and said this is one of the most important uh, experiments that have been done in molecular biology <laughs> and stuff like that so wow and, okay uh, and, uh so but the biggest problem was there was no evidence in any mammalian cells okay mm. so okay. what dr bargua had done was this is before uh, you know he came to uh, india mm-hmm. uh, he, he clearly even though dr brosha was presenting this here he had done it a couple of years before and okay. uh, Uh, for they were establishing this dogma of rna dna protein trna all this sequence so to show this in mammalian cells dr bargua looked for mammalian cells that uh, have no detectable rna he was working with francis okay. crick at the time mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, so he was looking for uh you know there are there is no such cell as cell without our mammalian cell mm-hmm. but anyway he found that sperm cells don't make any rna or protein oh okay okay the okay. mammalian okay. sperm cells at least they okay. have no detectable chemically detectable rna by the measurements they had okay. at that so uh and he took this sperm incubated with radioactive amino acids and looked for protein incorporation and he could show protein synthesis in these cells so he mm-hmm. published a lead article in nature saying that in some special in circumstances rna protein synthesis can be dictated by dna because sperm have oh. only in his at least in those days the concept was there is no rna but there is plenty okay. of data mm-hmm. francis cake was was not uh, very enthusiastic about these these studies mm-hmm. because he kept saying in mammalian sperm dna is in a crystalline form it is in the head so dna say sperm is is a very nice demarcation of cytoplasm nucleus and other organelles so the dna was the nucleus the tail was the cytoplasm okay mm-hmm. so he said all the dna is in the nucleus and it is in a crystalline form he had actually taken sperm head and exposed mm-hmm. it to x rays and showed that he can see a dna diffraction so this was okay. uh, this was one of those controversial 
things, but mm -hmm. Nature anyway published. This is Bargo's only single author paper. You know, he thought Francis wow. okay. Ford didn't want to be an author, but <laughs> <laughs> it's conflicting with his theory, right? So yeah. He published this okay. here. So okay. he said, Look, I have this project with me. I have this, I made this big observation. Uh, and what I want you to do is, uh, in those days, there was no radioactive urine. Okay. okay. People were incubating, I mean, they were doing chemical determination for mm -hmm. ribonucleic acid. So what he asked me, do you want to take up this project? It's going to be a very difficult project. You, you, know, you may have to change it if you don't succeed. Sure. I took up this project and uh, what I did was, uh, you know, I took uh, the sperm and incubated with radioactive uridine and radioactive phosphate. Okay. And sure enough, I found incorporation of radioactive uridine and radioactive phosphate into macromolecules. So clearly there is some amount of RNA. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then the question came: Even that is not possible because DNA is in a crystalline state. How is it being okay. uh, uh, synthesized? You know, how is RNA being made? Where is it being made from? And uh, uh, you know, so for that, I had to first extract RNA from sperm. And those days, there were no methods available. Wow. So okay. after. After working for about two years, you know, it was almost impossible to break sperm head uh, okay. you know, to make RNA. Then, luckily for me, uh, I was trying proteolytic enzymes and, uh, you know, physical mm -hmm. methods like grinding, radiation, uh, irradiation, all this, nothing worked. Mm -hmm. And luckily for me, I suddenly saw a paper where they were trying to extract sperm protein, characterize them. And okay. to dissolve sperm head, they used mercaptoethanol. Mm -hmm. So apparently, oh, the okay. cap yeah. is made, is tightly, you know, uh, closed by proteins that form SS bonds. Mm -hmm. So I added, you know, I was incubating with Pronase at that time, the proteolytic enzyme to dissolve and break proteins, and it was not doing. I added a little bit of ethanol, boom, <laughs> the DNA came out. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so that was okay. a lucky break I had. So when we characterized again, uh, this was very abnormal RNA. At that time, we knew what was the size of ribosomal RNA, it's 18S and 28S RNA, and 4S was the tRNA. And when I characterized my the RNA that I extracted from, it was 16S and 23S and 4S. Oh, okay. 16S okay. and 23S is typical of E. coli, bacteria. Yeah, bacteria, bacteria. Yeah. was lower size in than the mammalian or yeast. So the biggest criticism at that time was this is all bacterial contamination that I am looking oh. at. Okay. Okay. So okay. we put all kinds of antibiotics and reduced the incubation time and made sure there is no bacteria in the sense we plated the cells before and after just to see whether there's any, you know, in bacterial medium, bacterial other, and there was no growth. And in spite of that, we were getting the same result. Oh. And so, but we extracted the RNA and we also identified the protein. We could not identify based on molecular weight. We could not, I mean, there's so many different molecular weight proteins in the cell. We could not fix on what were the proteins that were being made. And uh, again, luckily for me, uh, they, there is an Indian couple by name Atadri and Atadri who are working at the University of Pennsylvania. They visited the RRM. You know, Dr. Bargo used to hand out yeah. these invitations to anybody who came to India. He would okay. say, <laughs> <laughs> come, to, come and visit my lab. <laughs> yeah, say, we will host you. We will come okay. and start. They came 
And these are uh, electron microscopes. And okay. they show, gave a talk showing that mammalian cells, mitochondria, have DNA in them. Okay, okay. and this mm -hmm. DNA transcribes RNA, which is 16 and 23 years in molecular mm -hmm. weight. Okay, and that was, you know, it suddenly occurred to me, maybe it is not the nucleus that's making this DNA and protein, it is the mitochondria. Mitochondria. The question okay. is, where is my, where are mitochondria in, in, in sperm? Where's mitochondria in sperm, yeah. Okay. No, there is actually. It's, oh, it's actually, okay. it's called, it forms a, a, a neck-like structure between the head and the tail. You know, okay. is the connecting thing, but you know, it never enters over. That's the reason oh, only yeah, yeah, it enters. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. The, we, we call the energies from mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Energies from mother all the time, right? The mitochondria yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, okay. the sperm, in sperm, the mitochondria, because sperm requires ATP for swimming. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And this is okay. the mitochondria are very active in oh, this yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and again, how to, you know, how to separate mitochondrial DNA from sperm DNA was a big question. And, uh, you know, then I, there was a, uh, I went to a, a butcher shop and, uh, <laughs> and purchased, you know, fresh liver, you know, sacrificed from one of these bulls uh, and okay. you know, brought it and uh, started purifying uh, mitochondria from bull liver because I was working with bull sperm, you know, uh, and- Yeah, uh, easy, easy uh, to get, yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we identified, uh, I mean, we would purify uh, the DNA from, uh, Mind, you know, bull uh, liver. liver, and then we incubated them same way as I did sperm, and we could show they are almost identical, the RNA pattern. And okay. but the, still, the question was it's all correlatory, but there was no evidence that yeah. this okay. these mitochondria and sperm are making the RNA, and okay. uh, so I. Uh, I, you know, I was trying to, I was struggling as to how to show this. Yeah. And then it's all, it's a lot of luck involved here. Dr. Spiegelman was invited mm -hmm. to RRL. He came and he described his experiments with uh, uh, hybrid, DNA RNA hybridization. He is the one who first developed DNA RNA hybridization mm -hmm. to show. RNA hybridizes to DNA. And I got the protocols from him. And uh, actually, I got protocols from his student, David Gillespie. <laughs> He's okay. the person. Oh. So I wrote to David Gillespie. He said, oh, I have even better method. You can fix the DNA and nitrocellulose filters, and you can do hybridization. And he sent okay. me some nitrocellulose filters. Oh. So okay. I did you know, I incubated sperm RNA, I isolated sperm RNA, uh, incubated with the bull liver, the so mitochondrial DNA, and I could show they actually hybridized to the mitochondrial DNA, but not to nuclear DNA. Mm -hmm. And we also, you know, characterized the proteins and essentially I did not do much work. I just showed the proteins made, you know, some of the proteins made by sperm, uh, you know, correspond to the molecular weights put made by the, you know, mitochondria mm -hmm. from the liver. So I can we communicated that paper to Nature, and it was published as a lead article in Nature. That was oh, a great okay. start for my career. <laughs> so from that time onwards, wherever I wrote for the application, I got admission. <laughs> oh, wow! Wow! I mean, there, there there's so many questions in my brain. So like the first one is that. You said you studied chemistry, but but you were yeah. fascinated with the biology, mainly the molecular biology, right? Yes. How did that switch happen? <laughs> that is <laughs> because you... I think that Ramachandran, so there was no biochemistry department in uh, Usman University. It was okay. started okay. when I was in MSU first year. 
I did okay. not know that there was going to be a biochemistry department. So okay. that okay. Ramchandran was there, but and so I think the wisdom of the principal of Usman University Chemistry Department was to make us take some biochemistry lessons. So okay. we had a biochemistry class, one class. Mm. It is not a major, but like a minor. Mm -hmm. And Ramachandran came, just came from uh, either UK or US, I don't remember. He was a very well-known protein biochemist. But mm -hmm. he, he literally taught us what is the most exciting that's going on in, in biology, which is discovery of DNA, RNA, protein okay. connection. Okay. So that, that's what made me go into into biology. <laughs> that's amazing. And it's amazing. And one another question for me is that you know the, the, the guts and, and, and the daringness to go uh, against crick, let's say <laughs> against central <laughs> dogman, trying to prove that there is no RNA. But I, mean, I, I won't, he, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Crick was very happy. Finally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because his theory is proven, right? <laughs> I, I I could show, you know, that there is actually DNA RNA protein connection. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and, and Professor Bargo was happy with that. <laughs> of course, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but his nature paper was there without RNA, right? <laughs> yeah, but this paper again, he was the you know, it was a two other paper, my name and Bargo's name. <laughs> okay. So, so he, he has to contradict his own theory. <laughs> yeah, he he solved the problem. Yes, technically okay. for the world. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and he was actually invited all over the world after he published that paper. Uh, okay. Okay. So he used to call me. I, I went to I quit I left immediately to UCLA Medical School for mm -hmm. postdoctoral work. Yeah, it was so 1971. Yeah. So yeah. Dr. Bargwa was was insistent I should learn immunology because his his okay. thing was immunology is the future of biology. You should get yourself trained in immunology. So I applied okay. to uh, again. So one person from an immunologist from NIH visited mm -hmm. RRM. I mean, Dr. Bargwa hosted okay. him. So, okay. uh, so Dr. Bargwa, you know, had a dinner with him. He invited me to the dinner, and he said, "Look, Prem just published this paper in Nature, and I am asking him to to I I want you to convince him that he should be study immunology." <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so. Then okay. I said, Look, I, I mean, I'm happy to learn immunology, but I don't think many immunologists would be willing to take me because I don't okay. have background in immunology. And okay. Faye, he said, Why don't you come to my lab? I'll give you oh. a fellowship. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so it's a uh, so I was getting ready for dinner, dinner, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I was <laughs> ready to go to Washington, D.C. to join NIH. Okay. And Fahey suddenly wrote me a letter saying that, look, I have uh, I, I had decided to take up another job as the chairman of microbiology and immunology in UCLA Medical School. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't mind, join me in the UCLA. Okay. Uh, sure enough, <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> So okay. I, I went to UCLA Medical School. And again, the question there was, you know, Fehi was now organizing a cancer center, organizing this new department. And okay. he was extremely busy. And mm -hmm. he said, look, uh, I don't have the time to personally supervise you, but mm -hmm. I have a very brilliant immunologist who came just to, uh, from London uh, yeah. as a, a sabbatical, two year sabbatical. It would be good if you work with him. He's a molecular biologist. So okay. this man's name was Alan Williamson. He's actually very well known at that time immunologist. Mm -hmm. What he showed, his claim to fame was he showed that plasma cells, you know, he was using plasma, mouse plasma cytomas. Uh, multiple myeloma cell cultures. He showed one cell makes only one antibody. Oh, plasma cells. Okay. 
So that was actually a major breakthrough in immunology because until then people used to think plasma cells make multiple antibodies and then there is a selection of antibodies in the, by the immune system. If you have an infection, uh, you know, why, you know mm-hmm. all these uh, myelomas, uh, multi, you know, myeloid cells, I mean, you know, plasma, plasma cells make antibodies, but it turned out it's only, one cell makes only one antibody. And okay. Is it true now as well, sir? That's yeah, what? that's how monochronal oh. antibodies came. See, oh. <laughs> that is the origin. See, macro yeah. antibodies came upon the recognition that a plasma cell makes only one antibody. So that was okay. the start of the monoclonal antibody technology. Oh. Okay. Okay. So I, you know, I, it was he. I, you know, he he said, "Look, I am having. I want to determine the number of immunoglobulin genes in the cell, and you are." very good in making RNA and DNA and doing hybridization, these type of studies. So do you want to undertake this, this, uh, 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 you know, this field, I mean, this project? I said, sure, this looks, sounds great. It's exactly what I did with sperm. It's even yeah, easier. Yeah. Plasma cells make tons <laughs> of RNA and protein and, and uh, so, uh, I, you know, but we were somewhat naive in this, you know, actually it's not naive. Phil Leader was doing the same thing in, in NIH. And there was another person, a Japanese scientist called Tony Gawa. He also did the same thing. What he did, uh, we all did was purify the messenger RNA from these cells and then fractionate it on sucrose gradients. So because you know, in plasma cells, we asked the majority of the messenger RNA is, uh, uh, is immunoglobulin RNA. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the RNA this, you know, plasma cells made was uh, a, a messenger RNA, about more than 60% of the messenger RNA was the plus in the okay. immunoglobulin messenger RNA, either heavy chain or light chain. And mm-hmm. by fractionating, we were thinking we have, we're purifying this. And then you go and hybridize it with DNA in solution with this technology at that time was called COT curves, COT mm-hmm. COT curves. You know, okay. it just okay. measures the number of, the more number of copies, the RNA hybridizes a shorter period. And if mm-hmm. it's a single copy, it takes more than 24 hours for it to hybridize. And mm-hmm. so, so I did these cut curves and showed, uh, you know, that there are a few hundred, you know, it, it has a biphasic curve. Initially, it rap- very rapidly hybridizes a portion of the DNA, uh, RNA, and then the rest hybridizes a little later, um, after 24 hours. So we interpreted this as the variable regions. There are multiple copies mm-hmm. of variable multiple genes of variable genes and we are getting faster hybridization and slower hybridization with uh, you know constant region portion of the immunoglobulin mm-hmm. message but you know okay. we I published a paper in PNAS Dr. Leader published a paper on lambda chain and then Tony Gawa published a paper on kappa chains and none of the pro papers, all all of the papers were very heavily criticized. You know, like you are, you are, you are purifying cellular RNA. There could be other RNAs which are represented by, you know, as a contaminant, uh, Mm -hmm. represented by, you know, and one example they gave was mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Okay, mitochondrial RNA is, there's abundant, if it is, your RNA is contaminated with mitochondrial RNA, you will get this biphasic curve because there are tons of mitochondrial okay. DNA copies. So of course there was, you know, then the only uh, uh, solution was to clone these DNAs and okay. then determine the copy number by similar studies. 
and, and so I by then, you know, their cloning technology was not available at that time, mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, you know, I was also doing protein synthesis. You know, what type of proteins are made? So now they have the Alan Williamson showed that you know if one plasma cell makes one immunoglobulin. Okay. Is this true mm -hmm. with with humans? Okay. And okay. John Fahey, with whom I was originally working, he mm -hmm. was an expert in culturing human B cells. So what he essentially used to do was take peripheral lymphocytes and infect them with EBV virus. EBV virus immortalizes them and then clone those in soft agar type of techniques, clone the cells and grow single cell clones. So I started working with uh, his cell lines just to see, see, are they making a single protein or multiple proteins? And it turns out vast majority of them make uh, at least in the ones that he cultured makes IgG. So, okay. um, I, so we, and again, when we tried to, there, uh, Dr. Williamson also was an expert in this technique called isoelectric focusing. It was just then developed. Mm -hmm. You can separate same molecular weight protein uh, into multiple bands using isoelectric focusing. And he had shown the plasma cells make a single band. And I did this with the human cells. And of course, I found single band, the majority of them. But suddenly in one or two cell lines, I started seeing both IgG and IgM. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So, and I, but IgG was abundant. IgM was very small amount. Mm -hmm. So, and these were, you know, we first thought maybe it is contamination of two cell lines. Mm -hmm. We cloned mm -hmm. the cells and did this. Again, we got the same result. So mm -hmm. then we published a paper at that time, cell just started. And mm -hmm. uh, we published a paper saying that there are cells which make two classes of antibodies, IgG and IgM, okay? and cell published it. And okay. then later it became clear that when B cell develops, in the beginning it makes IgM and then it switches the okay. constant region to IgG or IgA. Mm -hmm. So even though we did not know that, accidentally we discovered the switch of immunoglobulin synthesis that occurs in that's mm -hmm. why that paper is very highly quoted, even though it doesn't talk about switch. Mm -hmm. It's the first okay. demonstration <laughs> a single cell can make both wow. IgM and IgG. We published okay. this paper in, in Cell, and within a few days, I got a call from a, a scientist called Michael Potter. Michael Potter is the mm -hmm. person who developed all these plasma cytomas uh, at NIH. So okay. he had hundreds of these plasma cytomas, which were used later on to make uh, monoclonal antibodies. Mm -hmm. So he asked me, look, I have, we recently discovered a, a new virus. It's a mutant of uh, Maloney virus and it transforms. So again, I, I just give a small background about this work they did. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a scientist by name, Dr. Abelson. He was a professor at Harvard Medical School. And he went on a sabbatical to work at NIH. He was working with uh, uh, Dr. Rowe and Dr. Potter were colleagues. And he was working in that. They were used to publish a lot of papers together. He joined that lab. So at that time, Maloney leukemia virus was the best studied virus mouse virus in, in, in the world because Maloney was the NCI director <laughs> to start. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody okay. wanted to please him by studying. <laughs> okay. and number two, it was able to make 
uh, it was able to create leukemia very quickly. So what you do there, you take, you know, newborn mice or mice which are a few days old within one week and inject a small amount of this virus. Mm -hmm. And within about three to four weeks, by the time they become adults, mm -hmm. their thymuses become enlarged and they die of thymic leukemia. It literally looks because time has become so big, it is, you know, right above the heart and close to the neck. It all, literally the size of it strangles the mouth. They have, have developed problems with the breathing and all that. Mm -hmm. So a Dr. Abelson is a surgeon, <laughs> even <laughs> though he was working on virology, he's a mm -hmm. surgeon and uh, he asked Dr. Potter, what, do you, what happens if you, if you remove the thymus in these animals? Did, did it still, what, does, what kind of leukemia these guys get? Mm -hmm. He said, nobody did this experiment. So he and, took, and the mouse can survive sir, without thymus? It, 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 it does. Ah, okay. Okay. So okay. he took, of course, for surgery, you have to have you know, a reasonable sized mouse. So he took about three to four week old mice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's amazing. He did surge thymectomy of 300 mice. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 300 yes. mice and injected, uh, you know, the, the Maloney virus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And essentially what he found was 299 mice came down with T-cell leukemia. Now the oh, origin okay. is the spleen. Okay. So there are T-cells in the spleen. So this virus goes and infects the T-cells in the spleen and produces T-cell lymphoma, lymphomas. Okay. okay. But one mouse developed some form of leukemia which was not T-cell leukemia. Out of 300, about one. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing that they decided to study this one mouse, why this is not developing leukemia, T cell mm -hmm. leukemia. So Dr. Potter called me and said, look, we can't detect immunoglobulin by conventional methods in this cell. So it is not a B cell, it's not a T cell. But then we saw your paper you tell mm -hmm. us that there is some uh, primitive cells make very small amounts of immunoglobulin, IgM. Mm -hmm. Will you mm -hmm. be willing to do the same experiment if I send you some of these cells? You know. So we got this mice from him, which were mm -hmm. growing this in the, in the peritoneum. Uh, this is leukemic cells. So mm -hmm. I incubated them with the radioactive amino acids and I identified you know, immunoprecipitated IgGs and IgMs and IgAs. And that's what essentially I found was they make very small amounts of IgM. So I called mm -hmm. Dr. Potter and said, look, at least in my one experiment, it is, mm -hmm. you know, they form, they make small amounts of IgM. Mm -hmm. So at that time, then he said, I mean, will you be willing to work further on this? And mm -hmm. at that time, Dr. Williamson was leaving. Uh, his sabbatical was over. He was going back to London. And I said, I had decided to come back to India. Uh, you know, okay. And... Uh, I said, look, I am planning to leave. The main reason for me to come back to India was my wife is a phys was a physician. And it was oh, okay. very difficult for her to get into uh, internship okay. there. There okay. are all kinds of restrictions for foreign medical graduates, even though she okay. passed all their exams, ECFMG, FLEX, and all that. It was just like a nightmare for her to get into the uh, yes. training. And she didn't want to stay in the United States uh, as a wife, housewife. She said, okay. I'm going to go. <laughs> <Good bye. laughs> so, okay. so I told Potter, uh, Potter said, why don't you come and work in an IH? I said, look, 
I can come and work in an IH on this project. It will not take me more than a year, but I have a problem, you know, yeah. with my wife is a physician. She wants to leave because she cannot get into a yeah. medical training program. He said, oh, don't worry. I will get her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Admission as an intern. Uh, I know lots of uh, people. And, uh, uh, why don't you come? So okay. I convinced my wife to go to Washington, D.C., and uh, I went there. And, of course, Dr. Potter got her admission into a, a medic, you know, a, a, you know, internal medicine training program. Okay. And I started my work in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Dr. Potter's lab. And essentially what okay. we showed was this virus transforms primitive B cells and only B cells, mm -hmm. nothing else. Mm -hmm. It doesn't transform. They used to think this is a mutant of Maloney. It's a mutant, but in a very different way. It's not a point mutation or anything. It has picked up the able gene from, uh, from the host. So this mm -hmm. is the so-called able sun leukemia virus. It's, no. it, okay. So uh, while I was there, you know, it, it became clear this is a acute transforming virus which has recombined with the able gene, mm -hmm. able kinase, mm -hmm. and that kinase is forming, is, uh, is transforming, uh, you know, B cells. Mm -hmm. So again, we sent this paper to Cell and Cell published this paper Mm -hmm. And uh, and suddenly the recombinant DNA technology came. I mean, see, there mm -hmm. was a moratorium in the United States for recombinant DNA technology. Nobody mm -hmm. was allowed to clone a gene in U.S. Oh. So, mm -hmm. so Tony Gawa left U.S. and went to Basel, Switzerland, mm -hmm. and cloned the light chain gene and showed this very variable region hybridizes to a different region than this, the constant mm -hmm. region. And in plasma cells, the two come together, for mm -hmm. which he got the Nobel Prize. So oh, we, okay. we, neither us or our uh, field leader were able to do that study in the United States because we were not allowed wow. to. <laughs> so so okay. in any case, the recombinant DNA technology came and uh, uh, I wanted to set up a cloning lab. So the, luckily again, for me, my graduate training was very really helpful because uh, Jacques Mano, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering black opera, he used to come to RRL and give workshops in how to grow bacteria, how to grow phage, simple things like bacterial genetics. Uh, he's, he used to come for a week, and and his wife, who was again a French lady, who is also a scientist, between them they used to come uh, and give this two-week course. So I had known how to grow phage, how to make DNA from phage, how to infect bacteria, and all that. So I, you know, I went to Phil Leader and said, Phil, you know. Of course, we both missed this opportunity. Uh, I want to set up a recombinant DNA lab. He said, oh, Prime, well, I already set up in my thing. <laughs> you know, I am cloning immunoglobulin genes as you speak. Uh, even though we are a little late, there are a lot of other things to be done in immunoglobulin. Okay. Yeah. But then uh, that was too late, I felt it was too late for me to start working on immunoglobulin genes. But I had this Abel's and leukemia virus. And, you know, I wanted to clone that gene. And so I, there was, you know, I in a, while I was in NIH, there used to be, you know, very, you know, NCI was mostly virologists. And so the virologists, had their own separate symposia meetings and all that. So Dr. Potter said, look, you have 
it is not a virology study, but you have a very unique observation. Why don't you present this in this symposium? And uh, mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I went and presented this symposium. Uh, this, you know, the origins of this virus, how it was made by, you know, why, you know, by Abelson and uh, how it transforms B cells and what is this thing. So when I finished it, the, you know, Dr. Hubner, who is a very, very famous virologist, he's considered to be the, he had proposed the oncogene hypothesis. And uh, so he came to me and said, what are your plans? And Dr. Porter said, you are planning to go back to India. You know, is that true? I, get it, I, get it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm not yet, you know, because my wife started a training. I can't yeah. leave. So, <laughs> so then he said, okay. okay, I will give you a lab. What do you want to do next? I said, I want to clone this gene. This man had never okay. heard of it. Okay. He's, Okay. You know, I had to sit and explain to him what cloning is. And he said, why okay. do you want to do this? This is, you already have pure RNA. You can isolate. He said, no, yeah. I cannot sequence RNA, but I can sequence DNA. I oh, can precisely okay. tell what genes are, is present in the able cell leukemia virus. So he gave me uh, an independent position. So I joined his lab. And within a year of my joining, he retired and Stu Aronson, his, uh, you know, uh, number two, his uh, person in the, he's also a very famous virologist. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. became the lab chief. And essentially he came to me and said, Prem, you are the expert in cloning. I don't want you to limit yourself to just able some leukemia virus. I have dozens of these viruses, acute transforming viruses. Why don't you set up a lab? We'll give you whatever you want and uh, clone and sequence all these genes. Uh, sequencing was not easy at that time. It was Sanger, very difficult Sanger to conceive. It was, no, Sanger had, Sanger's method had not come into, it was not invented oh. yet. Okay. It was a maximum okay. Gilbert method which is okay. a chemical cleavage of DNA. Okay. So they got the Nobel Prize for this, but Maximum Gilbert was a very difficult method to sequence DNA. Mm -hmm. So I cloned Abelson leukemia virus, and then I cloned a bunch of, you know, MIC, MIB, RAS, mm -hmm. you know, you ask for it there, I cloned about half dozen acute transforming mm -hmm. viruses. And then the question is, you know, the, the cancer field was at a very inflection point at that time. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, there was a lot of, if you go to AACR meeting, there are literally fights between three groups. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there is a group of people who said, cause for cancer is chemicals and oh. mm -hmm. chemical carcinogens. Mm -hmm. They have identified carcinogens. You take these carcinogens and inject into your mouse, you get a tumor. No mm -hmm. question about it. In a reproducible manner, uh -huh. in a reproducibly in one organ, only very few chemicals cause cancer in multiple organs. But most of the chemicals cause you know, liver tumor, or mm -hmm. brain tumor, or pancreatic cancer yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So that was one group. There was this second group virologists who mm. said it is viruses that cause cancer. Yeah, so and it's yeah. yeah, and um, yeah. Dr. Hubner's oncogene hypothesis is there are endogenous viruses, which our genes encode for viruses, and they mm. start replicating as the a person ages, and they cause mm. cancer, which there's a lot mm. of evidence for that. Mm. And then there's third group, uh, you know, Dr. Peter Noel at uh, UCLA had identified the chromosomal translocation between 9 and 22, oh, which okay. is called, he called it Philadelphia chromosome. Yeah. This yeah. Philadelphia chromosome is consistently present in 100% of CMLs, chronic myelogenous leukemias. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. And he said it is the chromosomal translocations that cause cancer. Mm-hmm. And people could show chromosomal abnormalities in a large number of tumor cell types, especially solid tumors had multiple chromosomal aberrations, mm-hmm. chromosomal amplifications, these type of things. Mm-hmm. So this is the third group that mm-hmm. said the cause of cancer is not chemicals, not chemicals may cause chromosomal aberrations, but that is what is causing cancer. So we started for us, for me, the simplest experimental tool was a virus, mainly because I can, second group, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can transform cells in vitro. I don't have to every time go to an animal and inject it. For us to study mechanisms, you could transform cells in vitro and you get you know, these cells from exactly the same tumors uh, in vivo. So, you know, for, and plus, you know, and then there were all these viruses that were identified and Warmus and Bishop were the ones who first showed the SARC, Rous sarcoma virus, which was the first virus isolated, had a cellular DNA as a part of it, its, its genomic structure. And they showed that it is this DNA is important for SARC uh, transformation because when they made deletions in that, or mutations, uh, the transforming transform, transforming activity was lost. So that was that's they got the Nobel Prize for that work piece of work. Okay. okay. So, but then the general hypothesis was all these viruses that people identified, Stu Adams and Wade Parks and, uh, you know, hundreds of these, there are at least 200 different, these acute transforming viruses were identified, which mm-hmm. cause cancer. And they, the concept was all of them code for SARC genome. It is the only mm-hmm. one gene in the world that causes this cancer. Mm-hmm. So it gave me a golden opportunity to sequence these genes and, okay. mm-hmm. and see whether they all code for SOC. So first I mm-hmm. sequenced Abel's and leukemia virus. And it, it, it was a kinase and it had a lot of homology with SOC. Okay. okay? Then suddenly, you know, and a few others cloned, uh, or, you know, Warmus and Bishop cloned and sequenced or B2. Again, it was a kinase. Mm-hmm. So they said, oh, okay, we are modifying our theory. It's not SARC, but it's a kinase gene. Okay. okay? Mm-hmm. Different kinases are picked up by these viruses mm-hmm. and they cause cancer. Then I... Uh, so I was cloning other genes, and I cloned the the next the next sequence I published was uh, a, a AMV. A, AMV is avian myeloblastosis virus. It mm-hmm. it uh, transforms myeloid cells. That was the first mm-hmm. leukemia virus isolated. Every other virus, mm-hmm. you know, other than Abelson virus, transformed solid. They produce solid tumors. So when I sequenced AMV, it had oh. no resemblance to any of the genes that the kinase genes that were sequenced. There are only half a dozen. Oh. Okay. okay. So we I didn't know how to write a paper on this. Mm-hmm. So I sent this paper to science. The theme was not that this is an I said it's a new oncogene, but mm-hmm. the more important thing is. It has no resemblance to kinase SARC. Okay. So there must be other types of genes that are capable of transforming mm-hmm. other than kinase genes. Mm-hmm. And Nature Science bought the argument. He's, you know, ah, okay. <laughs> they published the paper. They wrote a, a news feature saying that okay. you know there is a brand new virus that is sequenced. It has no kinase genes associated with it. 
Okay. So there must be other categories of proteins. Mm -hmm. And also the, for me, the, the nice thing was the, the AMV was a, the, it was the MIP gene. It was a nuclear protein. Mm -hmm. Then I sequenced the MIC gene. And again, it was a nuclear protein. And it's again, it's not a kind. Oh, okay. It had no I, relation. I see now. Okay. All the, all the oncogenes. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I sequenced about a dozen oncogenes. And mm -hmm. one of them was RAS. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay. Uh, RAS from the virus. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there was a virus called BALB MSA. I sequenced that. There was another Indian, uh, uh, very well known scientist, Ravi Dar. Ravi sequenced the Rose nut uh, Harvey sarcoma virus. And, uh, uh, and oh, one of the Jap uh, Japanese investigators sequenced the Kirsten sarcoma virus. Mm -hmm. We all published together. And it turned out we all sequenced the same gene, but present in different <laughs> viruses. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. This is the so-called origins of RAS gene. But mm -hmm. there, you know, the biggest problem here was at that time, people were looking for these viruses in human tumors. Mm -hmm. You know, national the NCI gave out grants left and right. They must have spent a few hundred million dollars looking mm -hmm. for a human virus in human so is, is that the time when, when uh, I think the President Nixon at the time uh, uh, advertised war on cancer, something like that? War on cancer, yeah. 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 So, okay. so, so the idea then was if viruses cause cancer, you can make vaccines. Virus, yeah. virus genes, viral diseases are easily resolved, you, mm -hmm. you know, cured with uh, vaccines. Yeah. So that was the thought. But Watson, Jim Watson, was on the board of directors of NIH. Okay. And he said, not a single virus has been isolated from human tumors. So this oh, entire okay. field of virology is an artifact of animal cancers. So the okay. animals are going in a very dirty environment and they mm. may have picked up viruses and all that, but humans don't have virus. Mm. So we should not pay any attention to any of the work. In fact, he wanted all funding to be cut off to <laughs> virus related work. My God, this is horrible. <laughs> yeah, this is horrible. Yeah. But yeah. again, if there was a lucky break. I had cloned the Abelson leukemia virus mm -hmm. gene and sequenced it and showed it's a kinase. Mm -hmm. So okay. one of the investigators who also at Frederick, his name is John Stephenson. John mm -hmm. called me and said, Prem, can you give me your able probe? I am doing some you know, human tumor analysis and uh, I want to see whether mm -hmm. I have been screening them for SARC and I don't see any SARC uh, mm -hmm. you know, amplification or translocation or anything from this thing. He called me and I gave him the probe. A, a few weeks later, he called me, you know what? Your probe hybridizes to BCR able translocation locus. It is okay. right you know, mm -hmm. uh, he did not say, he said, Philadelphia chromosome translocation locus. Okay. And, okay. you know, already the sequence is known, <clears throat> people cloned the gene and showed that BCR able is nothing but the able gene fused to BCR. In the virus, it is fused the virus, pro virus genes in, in human tumor. This first okay. connection was, was with BCR able. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so that at least gave us some support. What we are doing is not just nonsensical work, or, you know. Not, no, yeah. not, not human. <laughs> okay. So yeah. at the same time, you know, there was another uh, colleague of mine, Mariano Barbaset. He was, mm -hmm. we were both contemporary. See, he's a little younger than me, from two years or three years. He was he's establishing his own lab. 
And he did not want competition with Stu Aronson or me or anybody. So mm -hmm. He wanted to pick a separate field. And so he, by then, people had shown if you take human tumor DNA and transfect into MIS-333 cells, at least 10% mm -hmm. of the tumors form transformed foci. So Mariano said, I'm going to work on solid, but at that time, people were still thinking human genes are different from viral genes. Mm -hmm. So this is a niche for me. I am mm -hmm. going to uh, work on this field. So his lab was right next door to me. And, you know, a lot of in his students, we were doing a lot of cloning. His students came and learned cloning uh, from my lab and uh, they, you know, they cloned the gene that they could transform from the T24 bladder cancer cells. Mm -hmm. So then Mariano came to me and said, Prem, we cloned this gene. We still do not know what it is. Will you be able to sequence it for me? Mm -hmm. And I sequenced it. Within two days, I knew this is RAS gene because oh. I had already sequenced the virus RAS. Mm -hmm. and you know, and when we are, and I could see the same sequence here, but you know, in virus, it's a cDNA. Here it is genomic DNA with introns dispersed. So we quickly, it was a seven kilobase sequence. We quickly sequenced this seven KB. I even sequenced the normal gene, you know, because at that time we did not know, uh, people were thinking, essentially overexpression of these genes is what causes cancer, mm -hmm. okay? So again, to confuse the field, you know, the first person who did this study was George Vanderwood. George Vanderwood took the cellular mouse gene and hooked it up to mouse LTR, uh, retrovirus LTR, which is the promoter sequence. And this drives these transcription to very high levels. Okay. 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 So, and he showed the mouse, the C mouse, C mouse gene, when it is driven by mouse LTR, transforms cells. Mm -hmm. Then Dr. Skolnick did the same experiment. He did, he took the mouse LTR, hooked it up to RAS and transfected into cells and showed it forms foci. So he said overexpression of RAS causes cancer. But when we looked at our cells, there is no overexpression, okay? okay? But still this gene is able to transform uh, mouse 33 cells. So essentially mm -hmm. when we looked at our sequence, what we found was there was a single point mutation which oh. is different from the normal, because I was sequencing mm -hmm. both normal and, see everybody mm -hmm. was sequencing virus genes and comparing with virus, but viruses had the same mutation that the human cancers had, the G12 mutation. So I had sequenced the normal gene and mm -hmm. we published this and actually the whole sequence in science showing that there is only this little difference. And so what mm -hmm. Mariano, so when we try to communicate this paper to nature, uh, they said, look, fine, you are showing that you have a gene that transforms cells and the normal gene does not, but you are not telling us what is transforming and what is not. There's no evidence that this mutation, it could be polymorphism. And, uh, you know, and people were arguing to our papers, this is all polymorphism. It's nothing, you know, this one mutation, uh, it will be, you will see these vitriolic editorials saying that how stupid we are, that we are <laughs> trying oh <my> to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mutation to transformation. So what we had to do is switch the fragment between normal and tumor. So we cut out the fragment that had the mutation, transposed it to new normal gene and the equivalent portion, we transferred it to the T24 uh, uh, RAS gene. 
And we showed when you transfer this exon that contains the mutation, normal gene acquires transforming activity. In those days, mm -hmm. in vitro mutagenesis was not invented yet. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So, so we had to. Oh my God, it's so much yeah. hard work, right? Yeah, you had to yeah. switch the clone. No PCR was invented. Uh, none of oh. PCR was came much later. Mm. If PCR had come before, there would not have been any need for cloning. <laughs> People <laughs> discovered cloning got Nobel Prize, <laughs> and you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. So, but then Nature published it, and okay. We published it, and then simultaneously, Stu Adamson also was also doing the same studies. Mm -hmm. So he had a Japanese postdoc. His name is uh, last name is Yuasa. He was a very brilliant kid, and uh, he was you know he was intent on finishing his postdoctoral training in two years, going back to Japan. So. Okay. He started cloning these, you know, I, he came and asked me, is it possible that these, these foci that are coming out from tumor DNAs, they may have different oncogenes? I said, yes, you know, technically mm -hmm. I am telling you, there mm -hmm. has to be different genes in humans, not only RAS gene cannot be a causative agent of uh, human tumors. So he took one, such clone, which seemed to be forming very slightly morphologically different type of focus in the, the uh, uh, transformation assays. You know, Stu Adamson is a very good biologist. He could identify different genes by just looking at morphology of the cells that are transformed. Oh, wow. Okay. This, so this was one. It was forming foci which looked like RAS, but was different according to uh, the morphology. So this guy cloned, and he was devastated when he cloned, mm -hmm. it was RAS gene. So RAS is old story. <laughs> For him, he will not be able to publish it anywhere, even, mm -hmm. you know, cancer research would not have taken it because Already 10 different people have shown that RAS genes are transforming agents for many of these tumors. So then I said, look, let us just do the experiments that are systematically, you know, for you to write a good paper. Why don't you do this exon switch that we did for T24G? Mm -hmm. And if we makes the normal, you know, I already had the normal clone. You just have to uh, do this experiment. Mm -hmm. He did the experiment in two weeks. He transformed the cells and he was elated. There was <laughs> no, no, you know, the normal gene when he switched the fragment did not form foci. So then mm -hmm. I immediately agreed to sequence his gene. Because I, mm -hmm. at that time, there was a lot of pressure built on me. There were dozens of genes. People are coming to sequence. Yeah. <laughs> that was the only sequence in lab in an IA. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. It's, you know, and uh, then I sequenced his uh, RAS gene. And so he tried to communicate this paper to Journal of Virology and mm -hmm. you know, saying that, RAS genes can be transforming with even when they are not mutated in exon 12 or something. Mm -hmm. They rejected the paper. So oh, okay. I, I sequenced it. And sure enough, I found there is another mutation in Quran 61. Mm -hmm. And then this is exon 2. When he switched that fragment with normal cells, a normal cell, a normal gene, it immediately mm -hmm. became transformed. Mm -hmm. So then we realized there are two places where this gene can undergo point mutations can happen yeah. and, mm -hmm. and become transforming. And uh, you know that was the I think one is one is two forty three or something or so, R two forty three somewhere. There are yeah. 
And he asked you as a paper, which was rejected by virology, now appeared as a lead article in Nature. <laughs> in a huge editorial saying that wow. this is, you know, grass gene can be, you know, transformed uh, okay. by mutations. In, it still, there was a huge, you know, there were people who were arguing that this entire exercise that we were doing mm -hmm. is nonsense because this is polymorphism. In fact, when oh. we published the Gordon 61 paper, they said, didn't we tell that <laughs> it 12 is polymorphism? Another polymorphism. Okay. Yeah, this is, you are discovering another polymorphism and you are in vitro assays or artifacts. They're not real. Oh, They're, oh my okay. God. Okay. It's a, so you have to show, you know, so the, the next thing we had to do was go to a patient, identify, you know, so get a tumor and normal tissue from the same patient, yeah. close the RAS gene and, and show that normal does, the tissue does not have the we, mutation. We were talking about which, which cancer, so which tissue? Because I know pancreatic cancer has cleared us quite a lot. Yeah, that I already know that pancreatic oh, okay. cancer was. So Mariano had a surgeon, uh, surgeon friend in Italy. And this okay. guy was willing to, he had collected lung tumors from a bunch okay. of cancer patients. Okay. And Mariano said, can you get me in, uh, the, the normal tissue from these patients? Oh, mm -hmm. he said, okay, some of them are still alive. I can get their blood and which will have okay. normal DNA. So he okay. sent us a bunch of these samples and Mariano, you know, did uh, DNA transfection, showed that one of the tumors transforms the MIS-33 cells. Then I picked that up and cloned the RAS gene uh, and sequenced it and showed it had a mutation and his normal tissue did not have the mutation. So again, mm -hmm. we published that in science. And again, it made, you know, even though it's a trivial, we knew it from mm -hmm. day one. This is just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, satisfy the criticism. Yeah, the polymor polymorphic polymorphism. Polymorphism. <laughs> <Well, laughs> <yes. laughs> polymorphism theory. And that became okay. uh, the, uh, and we published that and, and by then, all three families of Keras and you no, know, the, the one I sequenced from lung was Keras gene. Mm -hmm. So, and actually, ironically, will you believe it or not, it has the glycine to cysteine mutation. So now- that what you have discovered, yeah. At that time, this is 35 yeah, years. Okay. And it is that cysteine that is now being targeted by these new RAS drugs. Okay, so it, it is took thirty-five really years to target that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was very fortuitous that we had a lung cancer yeah. patient, and in unknown reasons, in lung cancer, thirty percent of RAS mutations are glycine to cysteine. Okay, so it's a question of numbers. We we got it because that is the most predominant mutation. And okay. now, you know, people are finding out 30% of lung cancers have cysteine mutation and these drugs mm -hmm. can target the, okay. the cysteine mutation. Wow, wow. So this is the, this is the discovery of proto-oncogenes uh, or real oncogenes. Oncogenes.